the journalist. He saw the ugly face of anti-Semitism. Who became a dreamer. And Theodore Herzl has his aha moment. And the idea. He was going to set the stage. That became a nation. A beacon to humanity. We begin our series, The Hope. I call it the jujitsu move, where you take the negative and you turn it into something positive. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. Listen, in the news, you've got uh, Iran. In the news, you've got Israel. Israel is under intense pressure from the international community. And so we're going to introduce today the first installment in our new documentary called The Hope. And over the next 10 days, we'll show you how courageous leaders founded the modern state of Israel and fulfilled Bible prophecy along the way. But uh, first in the news, Israel today could be facing its deadliest threat ever from a nuclear Iran. President Obama says his deal will prevent Iran from building nuclear weapons. But Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu says the deal could guarantee that Israel will get a bomb. Iran will get a bomb, right? Oh, excuse <laughs> me, I'm yes. sorry. I, I read that <laughs> Iran would get the bomb. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Israel is lobbying against that deal, as you can imagine, while the Obama administration is pushing in favor of it as Congress begins its 60 day period to review the agreement. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Both Secretary of State John Kerry and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu have been taking turns defending their positions. Ronald Reagan negotiated with the former Soviet Union. Uh, Richard Nixon negotiated with what was then known as Red China. You have to negotiate sometimes with people to make the world and your country safer. And we negotiated because President Obama thought the primary challenge here was getting a nuclear weapon away from Iran, and we believe this deal does that. There was a celebrated deal just a few years ago, a nuclear deal. Everybody, the scientific community, the international community, everybody applauded it. It was a deal with North Korea. That proved to be a stark mistake as well. And North Korea today has a dozen uh, nuclear bombs and uh, is on track to get, within a few years, 100 nuclear bombs. So uh, I think that this is a repeat of the mistake of North Korea. The clock began on the 60-day period for Congress to review the agreement. However, the Obama administration is planning to take the accord to the U.N. Security Council before Congress can vote. While Kerry and Netanyahu staked out their positions and Congress reviews the accord, crowds in Tehran shouted death to America. Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei vowed Iran's policy toward what he called the arrogant United States would not change and pledged to support its jihadist allies in the region. With billions of dollars in sanctions relief, many Middle East observers fear Iran will soon be able to resupply the terror groups Hezbollah, Hamas, and the regime of Syrian President Bashar Assad. In the meantime, as one more sign of the growing tensions in the region, 47% of Israelis would support a unilateral strike against Iran's nuclear program. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Just imagine the President of the United States says, well, I'm going to the United Nations, the head of Congress, and he's going to rely on the U.N. to decide what American policy should be. It's not, it's not a good deal. We don't know what's going to happen, but you guarantee those people are fanatic. Those people are without question fixated on the thought that the Mahdi is coming back, that there's going to be a, a international Muslim caliphate, and you go on and on and on, and they think we're the great Satan. Now, how are we going to negotiate with a deal with people like that? Well, I don't know, but the, the president is hard at it, and the left is saying, go get them. Well, on the Republican front, one of the front runners, the Donald, has been making headlines again after his comments about John McCain. But other candidates say he's gone too far. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. Media mogul, business tycoon, and Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump isn't backing down from his controversial remarks about the Arizona senator. 
a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war Five hero. and a half years. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. McCain endured more than five years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, including torture. Trump insists he supports veterans and argues McCain isn't doing enough for them. Fellow Republican candidates have condemned Trump's comments, including former Texas Governor Rick Perry. Donald Trump owes every American veteran, and in particular John McCain, an apology. And Pat, Trump is firing back, saying other candidates are making a fuss because he's leading in the polls. Well, he may be right. He's a, an interesting character, but the American people apparently want somebody who is uh, a little bit unpredictable. And the Donald has uh, uh, just uh, taken center stage. He's taken the air out of most of the Republican candidates. He is leading in the polls, and he's taking the headlines. Whether that will get him the White House is something else again, Terry. Well, I think some of it is also people want somebody yeah. who will say what they mean That's and mean right. what they say. And, and not a novel. play political correctness. He's not going to do it. You know, he, so anyhow, it may be unpopular, but, you know, one thing you really shouldn't do is criticize somebody's no, war effort. And I, I found people who never got near a, a, a military base, never had any service whatsoever, criticize me for my war service in Korean War. You know, they sit back and throw yeah. lob shells at you. So I, I don't think criticizing somebody who was as many years as John McCain in a prison of war camp and uh, endured unspeakable torment, that he should be uh, criticized. And I, I just don't think we ought to criticize uh, veterans for their service. If they've served our country, well, God bless them. And um, yeah. that, I think that should be off limits. And Donald, it's off limits that you stepped over the line. Now get back on the other side and get on with your campaign. John. Well, his name may not be as familiar as Donald Trump's, but Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker is one of the leaders in the polls among the crowded Republican presidential field. David Brody spent time with him in Iowa this weekend for his views on the issues and how he'd act as president. I believe in America. I love America. Scott Walker may come across as an average guy, but he's ready to aim much higher. I'm Scott Walker. I'm running for president. And I'm asking for your vote. Early poll numbers put the Wisconsin governor in the top tier of a very crowded Republican field. His campaign message, reform, growth, safety. If you made a list of common sense conservative reforms in this country, I don't think you could point to a one that we haven't accomplished across the way in Wisconsin, a blue state. That's Walker's claim to fame, a conservative governor getting results in a state that has not voted Republican for a president, at least, in more than 30 years. He's also battle-tested, winning re-election and overcoming a nasty recall effort brought on by liberals and public unions. He's built a tough reputation, even writing a book called Unintimidated, his critics think he won't compromise at all. Some folks will say unintimidated means I'm not going to compromise. And I know you're a student of history. Yeah. Ronald Reagan, the 80-20 model. Right. Do you subscribe to something along those lines? Well, I don't think you, comp you should never compromise your principles. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the details, I mean, I think as governor, you know, when I push for the stuff that, that probably most people know me about, which mm -hmm. was taking on the unions, I, I wanted 100% uh, repeal of collective bargaining. We tweaked it a little bit. As long as you don't compromise your principles, the details, you can always work that. A pro-life candidate, Walker wants to strip federal funding from Planned Parenthood. And he's called the Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriage a grave mistake. And he wants a constitutional amendment allowing states to define the issue, not the courts. Then a media report implied that he and his wife might take opposite sides on the marriage issue. Walker quickly cleared up any confusion. My wife actually supports my position, so that's that's something she pointed out. Her she was torn uh, by the fact that she's got me with a position and she's got other family members with a different position. But being emotionally torn doesn't mean that she's got a difference of opinion. And Walker's record shows he's no pushover. He told me that as President Walker, he would display that no-nonsense approach from day one. I'd speak out and take an active, aggressive position to call the Congress to 
fully repeal Obamacare and put patients and families back in charge and actually send up draft legislation to empower them to do that. Mm -hmm. I'd pull back on day, uh, day one on the bad Iran deal we just talked about. Uh, and I, going forward, uh, would make sure that we pulled back on so many of the other bad regulations under this, this president. Walker wants everything he does to be grounded in his faith. As the son of a Baptist preacher, he knows a thing or two about the Bible. You know, one of the scriptures I find to be most comforting is in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh and speaks the words of Christ saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it's just such a powerful, powerful reminder that no matter how challenging times are, um, his grace is more than sufficient. That's something he'll need in what is shaping up as a long and crowded campaign. David Brody, CBN News, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And Pat, as you well know, many political observers think that Walker is a formidable candidate. Well, there's no question about it. I mean, when you win in Wisconsin repeatedly against the, everything the unions had to throw at you, I mean, this guy is real. The thing of it is he's real. He is absolutely the genuine article, and that is a very important. There's so much insincerity, so much hype, so much uh, puffery, and this guy is right down to earth. And um, I think the American people will like him. As I would handicap this race coming forward, I think he will probably win Iowa. Uh, he could win South Dakota. Uh, he could win uh, Wisconsin. He could win Minnesota. Uh, he could win Kansas. That whole block of states in the middle of our country, I think, would be his battleground. And then take the campaign beyond that. Whether he'll have the money enough to do it, we don't know. But uh, he's one that I think deserves a second and third look, and I think people are giving him just that. Yeah, I, I really mm. like him. I think his yeah. book is appropriately titled. You know, he's not just a talker; yeah. he's a doer, yeah. and that's great to see. Well, you know, I, 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 we uh, featured his book, and I interviewed him. Um, he was a, a city. Uh, 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 I don't know what they call it out there, but uh, like the official that runs the city, like a city manager, he had experience from the grassroots all the way up. Mm -hmm. He knows government from the bottom up, and uh, he, he has uh, managed a state well. There's only one uh, prep for presidency, and that is being a governor. And uh, Ronald Reagan was a governor, and uh, others have been governors, and I think we now have a governor from uh, uh, Wisconsin. We have a governor from Texas. We have a governor from Florida. Ohio. We have a governor. Well, he's not in yet, but he's but probably he's coming. He's coming. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a former governor from Arkansas. So, but these are the people who I think we should be looking at by putting in an untested yeah. community organizer. We have had nothing but chaos in our government, and it was a big, big mistake. Anyhow. Uh, now we understand that the screws are being tightened on those poor Greeks. I think the prescription for their problem is wrong. The medicine will kill them worse than the disease. John. That's right, Pat. Greeks woke up this morning to a new era. Banks finally reopened after three weeks of being closed down. But now Greeks face new problems, including higher taxes on everything from meats to coffee, tea, restaurants, taxis, and more. Dale Hurd has that story. Large lines formed outside banks in Athens as limits on cash withdrawals remained in place. This pensioner says, I had 20 euros in my pocket when this happened. They said today that we would be able to withdraw 400 euros, but I could only withdraw 60. Greek banks closed their doors June 29 to prevent a bank run after the nation flirted with bankruptcy, having defaulted on its debts to the International Monetary Fund. Now, ordinary Greeks will have to pay for austerity at the cash register in the form of a 23% sales tax on many basic goods, making almost everything more expensive in this poor nation. Pensions have also been cut. Bank customers will still not be able to cash checks, only deposit them into their accounts, and will not be able to get cash abroad with their credit or debit cards, only make purchases. For Greeks, this is not a solution, and far left-wing Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras is struggling to contain a growing revolt within his own party. Dale Hurd, CBN News. 
Thanks, Dale. Pat, what do you think was the right prescription for Greece? Well, you certainly wouldn't want to slap them with higher taxes. That is the most regressive thing. And if you ever saw a tax uh, a regime that's going to hurt the, the, the lower classes, this was it. This hits the lowest level of society. It is totally regressive, and it is a big, big mistake. I, I don't think you tax your way to prosperity. What you do is grow your way to prosperity. And what they need to do is to reform their government, take away these ungodly pensions that they're giving so many people, take away the corruption that's there, take away all that bureaucracy, and let the Greeks come free. They are very creative people. But they've got to be released from a government that is loaded with bureaucracy and loaded with regulations that are stifling them. And the worst thing in the world to do in a situation like that is to load up with higher taxes, especially a sales tax. That, uh, I mean, it taxes every single commodity that a poor person needs to live. I mean, what a terrible thing to do to those people. The fault of their leaders and the people are going to have to suffer. Well, Terry, so much for that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad right now that I don't live in Greece. Well, many people are. <laughs> we will continue <clears throat> to watch the progress of what All happens right. there. Well, up next, the unlikely father of modern Zionism. He was not educated in the Jewish sphere at all. And all of a sudden, he saw the ugly face of anti-Semitism. Watch his aha moment in the first part of our new series called The Hope. That's next. A new project from CBN. This to me is one of the most beautiful, heart-rending, heart-moving pieces of film that you will ever see. And it's called The Hope. Well, in A.D. 70, the Romans conquered Jerusalem, and the Jewish people were scattered throughout the world, what's been called the Diaspora. But even in exile, they celebrated Passover each year with a prayer of hope next year in Jerusalem. And after more than 1,800 years, the dream of a Jewish homeland was stronger than ever. And in the late 19th century, a young writer from Vienna brought that dream to the attention of the world. In 1893, a Viennese journalist wrote, When I think of my son's future, I ask myself whether I have the right to make life so difficult for him as it has become for me. That is why we must baptize Jewish children, while they can still feel nothing, either for it or against it. We Jews must submerge in the people. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. It's not something you'd expect to hear from the man known as the father of Zionism. But those words were written by Theodore Herzl, who spent his life trying to solve what he called the Jewish question. Herzl was born in Budapest in 1860. At the time, the city was known as Judapest because of its large Jewish population. As a boy, he attended a Christian high school that was open to Jews. And on his 13th birthday, his parents held a confirmation ceremony instead of a bar mitzvah. Theodor Herzl was an assimilated Jew who came from an assimilated family. He was not educated in the Jewish sphere at all. and He was very, very far from Judaism. His family later moved to Vienna, where Herzl earned a law degree. But his real passion was writing. So he divided his time between writing plays, working as a reporter, and looking for a way to end anti-Semitism. Theodor Herzl is the one who sort of pulls it together, but there are many, there are Christian ministers, there are rabbis, there are, all kind, there are presidents, there are all kinds of people who are saying, wait a minute, we've got this problem. At one point, Herzl even proposed a mass baptism of Jewish babies 
in Vienna's largest cathedral. He believed that if Jews adopted Christian culture, they would finally be accepted by European society. But Theodor Herzl was about to get an assignment that would change his mind. It was as a journalist for the top newspaper in Vienna that he was sent to Paris to write about the wonderful French experience. Herzl, who was a bon vivant, you know, and was living in Paris and enjoying himself and going to the theater three times a week, and all of a sudden, he saw the ugly face of anti-Semitism. Herzl was assigned to cover the famous Dreyfus Affair, in which a French Jewish captain was falsely convicted of spying for the Germans. Herzl watched as Alfred Dreyfus was stripped of his medals and publicly degraded at the military school in Paris. Crowds filled the streets, shouting death to the Jews. People are inflamed and they're shouting, not down with Dreyfus, not down with the individual, they shout down with the Jews and Theodor Herzl has his aha moment. Herzl realized that the only solution to anti-Semitism was for the Jews to have their own state. Wonderful idea. How do you go about doing it? This is where the writer of plays came in, you know. He was gonna set the stage. Herzl shut himself in his apartment and wrote his ideas down for five straight days. When a friend of his visited, he was alarmed by Herzl's disheveled appearance and wild ideas. He suggested they get some fresh air. And as they walked, he told Herzl to get some medical help before someone hauled him off to a madhouse. Herzl paid no attention, and the following year, he published his most famous work, The Jewish State. Theodor Herzl, in his book, The Jewish State, dreams. And he talks about this new nation state being a beacon to humanity. He talks about it being a model democracy. Not everyone was thrilled with Herzl's ideas. Religious Jews thought it was blasphemy to reestablish the nation of Israel without the Messiah. Nevertheless, Herzl worked tirelessly to realize his vision. He even tried to buy the land of Palestine. He tried to create a situation where he will be introduced to the Sultan of Turkey and he will buy the land of Israel from him. Boy, that's gonna cost a lot of money. How is he gonna pay for it? Well, he had the dream, he had an idea. He says, I'm gonna take half of the riches of all the rich Jews. Well, of course, there was absolutely no chance that any of these people would do that. They did not want to see Zionism succeed, in fact. But he was convinced that that's the way to do it. In 1897, Herzl gathered Jewish delegates from around the world for the first World Zionist Congress. For this historic meeting, he chose the city of Basel in Switzerland. By the way, do you know why it was in Basel? It was supposed to be in Munich. And in Munich, there were Jews who called themselves Germans of the faith of Moses. And they said to him, we don't want this Jewish riffraff from all over the world coming to Munich. In August, more than 200 delegates from 17 countries arrived in Basel. It was the first representative Jewish assembly in nearly 2,000 years. And the atmosphere was electric. Behind the podium hung a white flag with two blue stripes and a Star of David, a version of the design that would be adopted by the State of Israel 50 years later. Among the delegates was a man Herzl introduced as the first Christian Zionist. The Reverend William Heckler was the British Embassy Chaplain in Vienna. He was deeply interested in the return of the Jews to Israel. So he helped Herzl make some important political connections and the two became lifelong friends. As Herzl walked to the podium, people cheered and stomped their feet. He opened the Congress by announcing 
we are here to lay the foundation stone of the house which is to shelter the Jewish nation. The applause was deafening. One English delegate described the excitement of the crowd. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. By the rivers of Basel, we sat down and resolved to weep no more. The beautiful thing about Theodor Herzl and the beautiful thing about Zionism is that it doesn't just stop with the negative. There is anti-Semitism and there is negativity and there's a certain rejection on the part of Europe. But what they also do is, I call it the jujitsu move, where you take the negative and you turn it into something positive. A few days later, Herzl made a bold statement in his diary. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. Perhaps in five years, and certainly in 50, everyone will know it. Herzl's statement turned out to be prophetic. 50 years later, the United Nations approved a plan to divide Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. And nine months later, the state of Israel was born. After the Congress, Herzl, who had never been religious, started observing some Jewish traditions. That winter, instead of having a Christmas tree, the Herzl family celebrated their first Hanukkah. Despite growing health problems, Herzl traveled the globe, trying to get backers for the new state. He went first to Constantinople, then on to Jerusalem in hopes of asking the Ottoman Sultan for land. Then in the spring of 1903, the need for a Jewish state became more urgent than ever as the world turned its focus on a small town in Russia. On Easter Sunday, a group of Russian Orthodox men entered the Jewish quarter of the village of Kishinev. Led by their priest, they shouted, death to the Jews. The same cry Herzl had heard in Paris during the Dreyfus affair almost 10 years earlier. Eyewitnesses described the bloody massacre that followed. Wives, along with their husbands, were shot down. A synagogue worker was killed protecting the Torah with his body. Children had their brains dashed out against the walls. And even babes were snatched from the arms of pleading mothers and hurled through windows. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses. After three days, more than 40 Jews were killed, 92 were injured, and more than 700 homes were looted and destroyed. Four months later, the Jewish Congress convened under the shadow of the massacre, but that was just the beginning. Herzl had good news and bad news for the crowd. The good news was that Great Britain wanted to help the Jewish people. The bad news was how they wanted to help. After the Kishinev pogrom, Herzl had an emergency meeting with British politicians. He asked them for land in Cyprus or the Sinai Peninsula, both of which were under British control. The plan was to rescue the Jews from Russia and still be close to Palestine. The British refused and offered them land in British East Africa, now Uganda. With no other choice, Herzl accepted the offer, and the British drew up a plan for a colony they called New Palestine. In 1903, Herzl presented the idea to the Zionist Congress with disastrous results. 
Zionism refers to Zion, and the plan was eventually to have Zion as the homeland. Nobody was giving this up. But for now, we're going to get ourselves a place to hide. It was the delegates from Russia, whom Herzl was trying to protect, who took the news the hardest. They stormed out of the concert hall in protest. Among them was a young man who would become the first president of the new state of Israel, Chaim Weizmann. The Zionists from Russia hated the idea, so they basically mounted a revolution against him and broke his heart. And he had been dealt such a tremendous shock that everybody doesn't take his word for the gospel truth. Herzl closed the Sixth Zionist Congress by raising his right hand and reciting a verse from the Psalms. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. These were the last words he would ever speak at the podium in Basel. Only his close friends and family knew that he was suffering from heart failure. And over the next year, his health declined rapidly. He told his old friend, Reverend Heckler, greet Palestine for me. I gave my heart's blood for my people. He died the next day. And at his funeral in Vienna, more than 6,000 people gathered to honor the man they had called King of the Jews. In 1949, the new government of Israel honored Herzl's dying request. They brought his remains from Vienna and reburied them here on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. During his lifetime, Herzl was called everything from a hero to a dreamer to a heretic. But his influence on the Jewish people is undeniable. In the last decade of his life, he gave them something they hadn't had in nearly 2,000 years, the hope of going home. He was an amazing man. He deserves a lot of credit. He had a dream, and it was a good dream. But you know, there's a distance between dreaming and between bringing something to fruition. It took pioneers. It took men of action, men of work. Herzl was, in the words of that wonderful song, the wind beneath their wings. Even before Herzl's death, thousands of Jewish pioneers were returning to Israel to carry out what they called the redemption of the land. We'll show you how they did it tomorrow on The 700 Club. That's an amazing piece of work that uh, our staff has done. It, it, it's a classic, and I think that everybody who is concerned about what God's plan is for the world needs to see the hope. Terry? Mm. Well, the history of all of that is rife with miracles yeah. and the Amen. move of God's hand. You just saw the first of a series of stories about the founding of the modern state of Israel. Be sure to watch The 700 Club because over the next two weeks, you'll see the rebirth of this nation through the eyes of its founding fathers. You can also log on to CBN.com and order the DVD or Blu-ray for just $10. And then head to our Facebook page, answer some trivia questions, and join in on the conversation there. We want you to have a copy of this for yourself. Well, coming up, Pat's getting ready for another round of Bring It On. Amanda says, I just found out that one of the pastors in my church believes that it is a sin to let his children say the Pledge of Allegiance. Is he right? Well, your questions are coming up next, so don't go away. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com.
Well, it's time to bring it on with your email questions. And Pat, this first one comes from Amanda, who says, recently it's come to my attention that one of the pastors in my church believes that it is a sin and disobedient to God to let his children say the Pledge of Allegiance. He uses Matthew 5, 33 through 37 to back up his belief, saying this verse talks about not swearing oaths. He believes the pledge is an oath which we should not participate in as Christians. I'd like to know what you think about this. Well, how does the Pledge of Allegiance go? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with life and liberty for all. Period. Yeah. That's not an oath. I pledge, I will be, a, I will have allegiance to the United States, to the flag and what it stands for. That is not an oath. Uh, it is a it's pledge. Really stating your pla patriotism for the country you live in. That basically says, I'm going to live in this country, and this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, people get so hung up on legalism. And uh, he here's what Jesus said. Um, again, you've heard that it was said, do not break uh, uh, your oath. But I tell you, don't swear. Uh, an oath at all, either by heaven or by God's throne. Uh, and do not swear by your head, for you can't even make your hair whiter. For, and all you need to say is yes or no. Well, that is, <clears throat> uh, you say, by God, I will not do this. You know, I swear that I will maintain this contract, so help me God. You know, uh, I swear by the hair of my head, uh, that's what Jesus said. You say, look, I'm getting a deal. I'm going to keep my word on it. That's all you need to say. Mm -hmm. Pledge of allegiance, totally different thing. Okay. Okay, let's go. This is Essa who says, I'm 16 years old. I've always had an unnaturally horrifying fear of being tortured and or killed for my faith. Is God trying to tell me something? Will God someday test me in this way because he knows it's my weak point? Sometimes I can't sleep at night because I'm so scared. What scares me even more is that I'm not sure if I would stand strong in the face of pain or death. What should I do? What you should do is realize that perfect <clears throat> love casts out fear for fear has torment. You need to be set free from that stuff. You need to be delivered. You have a spirit of fear that came from Satan. This isn't from God. God does not give us fear, for fear has torment. You know, a, a perfect love casts out fear. You need to fill yourself with the love of God <clears throat> and d don't worry about this stuff. I remember Corey Ten Boom. It was a wonderful thing. He said her father said to her, now, Corey, you know, when you're going to take a trip, she said, yes, well, uh, you don't need a ticket until you get ready to leave. And at that point, you get your ticket and, and you give it to the conductor. Mm -hmm. God will give you what you need when the time comes, and don't worry about it prior to that. All right? It's interesting that people think that God does things like create some scenario in our lives because he knows it's our weakest fear. I mean, that doesn't say very much about Knowing his no, loving but it nature does say does about it. Satan. Satan will hit us where yeah. we're weakest, and uh, that's what we, 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 we can't have. Perfect love, guess that for you. What, what else? This is a viewer who says, Do I have to fast for God to answer my prayers? No. Uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, King James says, This go without by prayer and fasting, but the and fasting was added to the uh, mm -hmm. Later documents, the more ancient documents, the more authentic documents say this goeth out by prayer, not in fasting. And, oh. and fasting is in the King James, but it wasn't in the, uh, the better Greek text. manuscript. Yeah. Huh. All right. Okay, this is Andrea who says, My husband and I got married in our home church by our pastor. Our pastor gave my husband the marriage license instead of sending it to the court. Recently, my husband told me that he lost the license and never sent it. Does this mean we aren't married? Nonsense. You're married. You you have uh, uh, you just didn't get it recorded in the courthouse, but you had the ceremony and you had a license, and uh, you could go and say I I, I was married. Well, I don't know what you have to prove and whether you're looking for social security benefits or the right of a spouse <laughs> or something, if you have a lawsuit, but. Uh, 
Uh, yes, you're married. All right. <laughs> okay, that's all the time we have for today. But thank you for your questions. We love hearing from you. Up next, a drinker who dabbled in the dark arts. I sought help through New Age type books, psychic events, psychic fairs. The bottom line is that I was seeking peace. See how she found that peace in an unlikely place after this. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. British Prime Minister David Cameron is launching a five year plan to defeat radical Islam. He says it's time to counter the ideology attracting so many young people to ISIS. Cameron also says young Muslims should feel like they have a stake in Britain. Thousands of Muslims have left Europe to fight with or support radical Islam in Syria. Superbook is now airing on Bible TV, Germany's largest Christian channel. Two episodes air each weekend, reaching children throughout Germany. Austria, Switzerland, and other neighboring European nations. Viewers can also connect with Superbook on Facebook and the Superbook website, where they can play games, learn more about God, and discover Bible stories in fun and exciting ways. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. For 40 years, Susan Folger was a prisoner. She spent decades of her life handcuffed with a drug and alcohol addiction, one that, ironically, she never conquered until she found herself literally behind bars. I was one confused and scared little girl. I would hide under the covers in my bed, or I would go into the closet and hide behind my clothes. Susan Folger could always tell when her parents had been drinking. There was never any physical violence, but there was verbal violence. I got wrong messages about myself, about what love is, about relationships. Susan says her home life made her feel like an outcast. I didn't really believe I fit in with the other kids. I thought everybody else had um, successful and loving families, and I thought mine was not like that. And so I was probably angry, thinking that I had been, quote, dealt a wrong hand. She found that drinking and smoking marijuana helped dull her pain and gave her a shot of confidence. I became a person that I thought I wanted to be, uh, very outgoing, very outspoken, and very loud. I would get aggressive, thinking I was very witty and, and funny and entertaining, and actually people probably wanted to run from me. Over the years, her abuse of alcohol and prescription drugs affected every area of her life. She had two failed marriages and was later arrested several times on DUI charges. She felt helpless to change, and at one point, even considered suicide. I just gave up hope. I was ruining my health. I was ruining my relationships. I was so unhappy and making everybody that loved me unhappy, too. After a third DUI, Susan went into a court-ordered 12-step program. It opened her eyes to the possibility of a higher power. Seeking spiritual answers, Susan turned to the occult. I sought help through self-help books and New Age-type books. I also attended seances and uh, psychic events, psychic fairs, and had uh, tarot card readings. I think that they, they made my life uh, actually darker. The bottom line is that I was seeking peace. I was very miserable, and I would have done, paid anything to obtain that peace. It never entered my mind that I could reach out and ask for help from my Creator, from God. Susan was given her fourth DUI after police pulled her over for erratic driving, and she tested positive for prescription drugs. Susan was then sentenced to five years in prison. I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe it. Oh my gosh, I'm going to prison. I'm going to prison. The only book that Susan was allowed to take with her was a Bible her sister had given her. With time on her hands, she started reading. Amazing things started happening as I'm reading that Bible. 
She also began to attend prison chapel services. As the days went on and I got clearer and clearer, I realized how very messed up I had been for a very long time. God started working my life in very personal, personal ways, amazingly personal ways. In my heart, there had been brokenness. In my heart is where I was asking the Lord to come in and change me. Jesus started becoming real to me. I started understanding that Jesus was, is the Son of God. Early one morning on the bunk in her prison cell, Susan surrendered her life to Jesus. I knew I was different. I had this love in my heart, this unexplainable, amazing love in my heart. I knew I was different. I knew my life had changed, had taken a turn, and I knew everything was going to be all right. Susan was released from prison after a year and left behind her addictions to drugs and alcohol and all involvement with the occult. She tells her story in her book, I Went to Prison to Be Set Free. Susan now lives in Austin, Texas, where she serves in a local church. Jesus is well aware of each person's issues, of their struggles. He's their creator. He knows. He knows their hurts, and he wants to help. But he's a gentleman. He has to be asked. Oh, my gosh, he's there, and he loves with an amazing love. He changes. He makes beauty for ashes in everyone's life. He'll do that for anyone. It's a strange thought, isn't it, to think that you would have to go to prison to be set free. And yet, in a way, every one of us is stuck in a prison of our own making until we understand who our Creator is, that He wants to have a relationship with us, that in fact, we were born for that purpose, created with that in mind. Before that, in our search for meaning and for the peace that Susan talked about and the joy that she was looking for, you know, we try to do that on our own and it just gets messier and messier and messier. Maybe you can relate to that today. Maybe as you've tried to find some gleam of hope for the future, some light on the horizon, some freedom from whatever it is that's binding you. Maybe freedom from the pain of failed relationships or you're de just dependent on things to keep you going from day to day, but there's no peace. There's no peace in it at all. There's peace available to you. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He did die for you and I. He was a real man who came and lived. He was the Son of God. And today, the invitation that Susan talked about is available to you. So what will you do with it? You know, it's one thing to have head knowledge up here about <clears throat> God, who he says he is, but it's another thing to surrender. It's another thing to say, God, I need you. I want you. See, there's no question on God's side. He wants you. He loves you. He's always been there for you, even when you haven't recognized that he's there. But what about you? What about you? When are you going to stop running or trying relationship after relationship, chemical after chemical, something to take away the pain? You know what it's doing? It's masking a need that's there that can't be filled by anyone but your creator. So today, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him into the midst of your, your life. As Susan said, he's a gentleman. He's waiting for your invitation. And once you ask, he's there for good. So right now, today, just pray, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Come into my life. You know every aspect of my being. You know my sins from A to Z. Forgive me all of them today, God. Change my heart the way I think. Teach me your ways. Fill me with your Holy Spirit now. In your name I pray. It's the beginning of a new life. What do you do now? We've got a packet. <clears throat> it's called A New Day. Pat put this together just for you. How do you grow in this new relationship? This is free and it's yours when you call the toll-free number on your screen. 
You don't have to do anything but say, I prayed the prayer today and I'd like the, a new day packet. There's our number, 1-800-759-0700. They'll send it to you right away. Pat? Thank you, Terry. People are calling right now and the phone's available for you. Uh, even though the program is off the air, uh, councils will be here 24 hours. We leave you with today's Power Minute, taken from Jeremiah 31. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Tomorrow, you're going to meet the pioneers who transformed a desolate wasteland into the Holy Land. It's all part of the hope that I think it will be groundbreaking cinematography. But we'll see you then. Until then, goodbye.